Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. And welcome back. Among the most notable celebrities born in St. Louis, Josephine Baker is near the top of the list. She was a dancer, singer, actress, and activist. Born in St. Louis in 1906, she grew up in the Mill Creek Valley neighborhood, an historic African-American community torn down in the late 1950s, which we profiled on this program earlier this month. Baker grew up poor and came to experience racism and segregation at a very early age. She left St. Louis when she was 15 years old and headed to New York City. Her popularity as an entertainer surged a few years later when she made her home in France. What's not as well known or remembered about Josephine Baker is her quest to create a racial utopia. For more, here's producer Alex Hoyer. Joining me now is Emmanuel Berry. If that name sounds familiar, it's because she used to work at St. Louis Public Radio. She's been a guest on this program and was one of the co-founders of our podcast, We Live Here. Emmanuel is now based in New York City and works at Gimlet Media. She's a producer of a podcast called The Nod, and she recently produced an episode about Josephine Baker. Emmanuel, welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. Well, thank you so much for having me. I don't want to get right to the central part of this episode, and that's about Josephine Baker's quest to create a racial utopia. What is it about Josephine Baker prior to her quest that really stands out to you? Well, I mean, Josephine Baker is sort of like an impossible human being when you think about her, right? She managed to escape poverty and become a star kind of all within the span of 20 years. And then not only that, like, she continually was reinventing herself into all of these different and sort of in, like once again these impossible things to be which was like you know a, a black female star in in this time period where you weren't allowed to be black and famous in some ways uh a woman who made it from you know being a stage star to being in films and movies and then and then made it from that to you know working as a french spy like all of these things sort of seem absolutely impossible and so i think part of what attracted me to josephine baker is that sense of living this absolutely impossible life at a time when for a black woman it shouldn't have been possible among all of the seemingly impossible things that she did and you detail some of them in the episode was was, as we mentioned, that quest to create a racial utopia. And at the very beginning of the episode, you say that you became obsessed with that small part of the story. Why obsessed? Uh, I was, I've re- been realizing in in my work and the stories that I've been pitching for the show I work on, uh, which is a show about black culture. And I think this is a conversation that or a thought that a lot of black people have, which is sort of like... Um, is there a place for me to escape? Like, is there a space in the world where it would be okay for me to be black and like for me not to encounter any problems with that? Um, and so I've, I've actually realized in just the stories I've been pitching, which are even different than this Josephine Baker story, that this idea of a utopia or this idea of sort of like escaping sort of racial prejudice or finding a space where it's okay to be a black person is something that like I have thought about a lot and I'm really, really interested in. So whether it's like a story about a a freedom town in Texas that I've been thinking about or the story looking at like blacks in Russia in the 1930s. Um, And this is sort of like uh, this Josephine Baker story was just sort of like another uh, piece to that, which was me sort of looking at, okay, someone who's actually just trying to build a racial utopia within their own little little family. Um, so, so I think there's something that really attracts me to the idea of, of is it possible to like find these spaces and live in these spaces? Because um, it, yeah, I, I think it's it's a question or something that dwells in a lot of people's minds. And that's really what The Nod, your podcast, is about, the one that you're a producer of. You you mentioned that it's about black culture. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah. So uh, The Nod is, uh, it's all about looking at all these different, beautiful, unexplored aspects of what it means to be black. Um, And so it ranges from things that are, you know, more historical or serious, like Re-examining historical events to uh, stories that are kind of maybe on the more silly side, uh, like Beyonce conspiracy theories uh, from YouTube videos or 
we'll talk about something like black sexuality or the show will delve into, you know, pressing issues like is Lawrence from Insecure good or bad for black people? Um, And also things that are like personal narrative essays about what it means to be black. Uh, So just sort of really broad range of what it what it means to be a black person in America, because it isn't this monolithic thing. Uh, and so the show is really about presenting and bringing forward all of these different things that we don't often hear about in mainstream media. So back to the story of Josephine Baker and her quest to create a racial utopia, I want to play a clip of the podcast. This is about two and a half minutes, and it kind of details her motivations for wanting to do what she did. Over the course of 20 years, Josephine went from being an exotic burlesque dancer to a French film star, from a French film star to a French war hero. But in the 1950s, Josephine decided she wanted to start a family. And she wanted that family to live in a different world than she did. See, as a girl in St. Louis, Josephine had watched the race riots of 1917, watched as mobs beat and bloodied her Black neighbors, Watch from the banks of the Mississippi as East St. Louis turned to ashes. She saw how hatred destroyed lives. So she wanted to challenge more than rules and regulations. She wanted to challenge the feelings behind Jim Crow. And she was a brutal realist uh, politically, and in this sense, her brutal realism was about changing the way we think and feel about family and about closeness and about proximity because she felt that that was the root cause of racism. She may have been a brutal realist in calling out segregation and racism, but her solution for fixing this problem was pretty abstract. She wasn't going to start a protest or a boycott. She was going to build a family. Josephine talked about her plan years later at a press event in New York City. Now, I suppose you want to know why these children were adopted. Well, let us say I use the word adoption to you, but at home we don't. We say we just met each other on the road of life and we both needed love and we're growing up together. Josephine had always wanted kids, but she couldn't have them. So she decided to adopt. And in building this family, she was fulfilling this desire to be a mother, but also to change the world. Seeing that people were misunderstanding each other, I decided to unite, it, to unite from different parts of the world little small children who were innocent before they had come in contact with influences, be they good or bad, and to find out if it were, were really possible for people of different countries and continents and religions and colors to live together. So this family was about showing those who would discriminate, those who would burn down Black neighborhoods, that they should be ashamed. That's a clip from The Nod. That's a podcast that Emmanuel Berry is a producer on, an episode about Josephine Baker. Now that we know what she wanted to do in assembling this family, how did she go about doing it? Well, she went about it in a way that in no ways would really be possible today. Uh, and that is sort of while Josephine is traveling around the world uh, and and touring, she sort of just starts you know, choosing babies. Uh, You know, uh, some of them were from orphanages. Some of them, like the child that she got from South America, she made an agreement with his father or with with his grandfather, who was supposedly like a indigenous chief. Um, So she's she's sort of just traveling all around the world, particularly looking for sort of these ethnic groups to cover. So she needs to make sure that she has a Jewish child. She needs to make sure she has a child, you know, from uh, each from sort of each continent is another way she thought about it. She wants to have this, the, make sure that she has this diversity in terms of ethnic group and in terms of religion. So she's really just sort of traveling around the world, adopting kids, and it just doesn't stop until she ends up with 12 of them. And wasn't it the story with the Jewish identity that, that her son Moses wasn't really Jewish? Uh, so she had tried to adopt a child from Israel, and Israel said, no, uh, we're we're not going to let you take a child of Israel out of Israel. Uh, and so what ended up happening is she ended up basically kind of like a, assigning a Jewish identity to a child who she had adopted from France. And it was just sort of like you 
your de- identity is Jewish. Mm. One of the central characters in your episode is Akio, who was Josephine Baker's oldest child. Set that story up about who Akio is. So she went to Japan. She was in, on tour in Japan. Um, and, the, and the way that he told the story was that um, because there's sort of different accounts. If you look at Josephine's official biography or autobiography that her and her husband co-wrote, it's it's told differently. But I think um, that's pretty common for autobiographies for there to be, you know, uh, dif- different stories. Uh, but the way that Akio understands it is that um, he wasn't supposed to be adopted, um, that she had come because she wanted to adopt uh, a Japanese baby, and Akio himself is Japanese and part something else, part something unknown. And so in some ways he didn't fit maybe exactly what Josephine was looking for in terms of, you know, if she wants this family that represents these very specific groups or, or types, really, um, it, he didn't necessarily fit. But then when she saw him, she she really wanted him. Or this is this is how he sort of retells this, this story. And so she decides to take both of them. Um, but what ends up happening is he says that, like, she was sort of thinking, oh, I'm going against my plan. You know, if I adopt two kids who are both Japanese because Akio is Japanese and something else, but they don't know what the something else is. Uh, and so he ends up just sort of becoming Korean. The <laughs> he, he he ends up with sort of a different identity. And he actually didn't know that he the one the one identity that they did know for sure is that he was for sure Japanese. Um, and he didn't know that he was Japanese at all until he was in his 20s. Um, so it's sort of another example of sort of like shifting and and trying to fill out these these spaces uh, in the way that um, in the way that they they wanted to create sort of this family that that had this image of the world. So there are 12 kids eventually. And uh, at this point, Josephine Baker is in France. She'd been in France for a long time at this point. She lives in a castle. And uh, you talk about in the episode how she goes about creating a sort of tourist attraction. What's the part of this story? Yeah, so she had vacationed a lot in the south of France, uh, and she bought herself a castle, a, a chateau, I think it's 14th or 15th century, and she called it Les Melandes. And sort of the the idea behind it was that she was going to build up a whole tourism industry um, in this area. And so she, there's this there's a space where there's a castle, and then sort of like there's, there's like almost a, a compound like down the hill where there's like a club and a cabaret and sort of some amusement park type rides and stuff like that. Um, but there's also these advertisements which are kind of like, you know, come and see come and see the Rainbow Tribe. And, you know, when I was talking with Akio and, and, and other articles or accounts I read, a lot of the things that the kids talk about is, you know, we got to live in a castle that was really cool. <laughs> but they also all, um, not all, but in, in some of the accounts that I've read, they talk um, also about, you know, not liking all of these strangers kind of staring at them. Uh, you know, they're just little kids playing and, and to have all of these people just sort of watching them. Um, and so the 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 because the family, the purpose of the family, like they couldn't just be a family. They had to be visible. They had to be seen. And so sort of like this idea of it needing to be witnessed that all of these kids from different races and backgrounds were playing together in harmony, either from like, you know, the local level of, you know, French people coming to the countryside to, to see it for themselves with their own eyes or whether that was photographers or the press coming to, you know, document that fact. What was the public's reaction to this attraction? Um, it's sort of interesting. I think we have to take a second and think about the fact that we're looking at this through the lens of 2018, right? We're looking at this through a very different time period. Um, but at the time, I think the rea- the, the reaction, a lot of what you see in newspapers is sort of like, you know, a lot of praise for Josephine that she's sort of taking in all of these orphan kids and a lot of praise in the sense, you know, that this is this is a really interesting and, and and great idea and look look at what this woman is doing and all these kids are getting along together in perfect racial harmony. Wow, look at this. Um, and I think some people sort of dismiss the idea. I think there's definitely that sort of sentiment too. But I think at the same time, you know, there were there was the French public at one point was really saying like she should get a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for for the work that she's doing. Um, so I think now, like in, even when I was telling the story, I felt sort of like conflicted because I'm sort of like this a lot of this feels wrong it feels it feels very dated uh sort of the idea or it feels like uh 
it feels like it's not really addressing the problems that need to be addressed. Um, or it, it feels like it's a little crazy in some ways, right? Um, but I, I think a lot of people were like, this is kind of revolutionary. And we have to keep in mind that at the time there was also sort of this sentiment of of hearts and minds, right? Like if we can just get people to change their, their hearts and minds and, you know, feel um, – and and be more open and treat each other like brothers then then this might not be a problem anymore and you know it, it's not until like a little bit later that we start thinking about systems of of power and, and structure and how that all fits into that and like that wasn't that wasn't what Josephine's activism was about well and one of the questions that you even ask yourself is how can a black woman have such a bizarre understanding of ethnicity and and i thought that that was an interesting way to try to square who Josephine Baker is and really, in essence, a civil rights pioneer in many ways with, with as you were talking about, this this kind of something that happened decades ago. Mm-hmm. And, and it is sort of, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a difficult space to navigate or figure out. I mean, from some of the reading I've done, like Josephine, she didn't like the word black. <laughs> she didn't, she didn't like she didn't like this idea that we were all very separated. Like for her, it was all about coming together and, and almost mixing sort of like this multiculturalism idea that, that maybe we were taught in like preschool <laughs> or elementary school. Mm. Um, and it's, it's simple. Like there's something so simple about it that is, that is like so appealing, I think in some ways. Um, but it's also like, it's too simple. Like it ignores so many other things. And I just think in general, like Josephine Baker is just this really complex person who in some ways, because maybe she was, a black woman who was able to do all of these things that black women weren't supposed to do in some ways, maybe that skewed, not skewed, but I think that definitely shaped her understanding sort of, of, of race and ethnicity. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's sort of like she wanted part of, part of her activism or part of how I think about it sometimes is just sort of that, like she wanted to be a rich black woman who could do whatever she, who could do whatever she wanted. And, and that's what kept kind of getting thrown in her face when she would come back to the U S was that like, she she may be able to own a castle in the south of France, but she you can't eat at a restaurant in the U.S. at this counter because you're black. And like that was not unacceptable to her, basically. I think one of the big questions is, did it work? Did the Rainbow Tribe, her quest to create a racial utopia, did it work? Um. So, you know, she set out to create this this as for a couple of reasons, right? One of them being the fact that she wanted a family. Like Josephine Baker was not able to have kids herself and she wanted to be a mother. She wanted to have a family. Um, and so in in that way, I think it was successful. Um, she she did create a family. Like the, the kids are still, they st- they're still in communication. They are, they are a family. Um, and so I think it's successful in that way. Uh, in terms of sort of like, you know, if the idea was to create a racial utopia that could serve as an example and create a space, you know, that this was sort of like a, a solution to end racism. N- no. <laughs> right. Like that's that's not what happened. Um, and I the, I think part of it is it's sort of just like it's it, it's a plan that sort of it, it's an impossible thing to do. Like the only person who could have done this is Josephine Baker. You know what I mean? Like other people can't go around like forcing people to be together in a space, right? That, that if if that's if that's sort of like the way she thinks about um, the way she she thought about this being solved, like that's not something that works on a large scale, and it doesn't address all of these other problems and issues. And what she runs into really when 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 she gets older and as time passes, right, is that this idea in the 1950s that people were like, oh look, she's adopting all these children. Look, they're all playing together in racial harmony. You know, by by the 1970s, it's like that feel even in the 1970s that feels dated and and um not like the right approach right because we're thinking about black power at this time we're thinking about you know dismantling things in very different ways uh and Josephine Baker even ran into like she she didn't like the idea of, uh she ran into some uh I think it's a, actually an article that was published uh, maybe by the St. Louis Post Dispatch, where she's sort of saying things about Black Power, and she she just didn't even like the phrase because she felt like it was saying one race was better than the other, and so she's really sort of at this point running into two barriers with her thinking and activism, even just in the 1970s. Um, 
so so no <laughs> is, is sort of the short answer. Did this work? Did it create a uh, a racial utopia? Is racism over? No. Um, but she 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 did get the family out of it um, that she was trying to build. After spending all this time researching Josephine Baker and really delving into this story, what is the takeaway for you? I mean, part of it, I think, is that complexity in terms of how can this woman be someone who who was such an activist and who, you know, is going about and breaking all of these barriers and sort of ha- also be this very flawed person in some ways, whether that was sort of in some of the ways that she thought about race and ethnicity or in you know, some of the ways that she, she handled, um, you know, being a mom to these kids, right? Like, because that wasn't all perfect. And just sort of that racism will make people do not bizarre things, but like make you really search, search for answers in, in, pla- in unexpected places. Like, that's another thing that I don't know I get into in the story so much, but it's just sort of this idea of like the the things that, that people will do to try not to experience racism, to escape this. Uh, and that's that's also sort of a sentiment or or a thought that really stuck with me um, after doing this story. That's Emmanuel Berry talking with producer Alex Hoyer. Berry, formerly of St. Louis Public Radio, is a producer for the podcast The Nod. And she was talking about her recent episode about St. Louis and Josephine Baker and her quest to create a racial utopia in France in the 1950s. It was called The Rainbow Tribe. We have a link to the full episode on our website at stlpublicradio.org. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.